Section twenty six of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter twenty three The Revelation of the Scarlet Letter. The eloquent voice on which the souls of the listening audience had been borne aloft, as on the swelling waves of the sea, at length came to a pause. There was a momentary silence, profound as what should follow the utterance of oracles. Then ensued a murmur and half-hushed tumult, as if the auditors, released from the high spell that had transported them into the region of another's mind, were returning into themselves, with all their awe and wonder still heavy on them. In a moment more the crowd began to gush forth from the doors of the church. Now that there was an end, they needed other breath, more fit to support the gross and earthly life into which they relapsed, than that atmosphere which the preacher had converted into words of flame, and had burdened with the rich fragrance of his thought. In the open air their rapture broke into speech. The street and the market-place absolutely babbled from side to side with applauses of the minister. His hearers could not rest until they had told one another of what each knew better than he could tell or hear. According to their united testimony, never had man spoken in so wise, so high, and so holy a spirit as he that spake this day, nor had inspiration ever breathed through mortal lips more evidently than it did through his. Its influence could be seen, as it were, descending upon him and possessing him, and continually lifting him out of the written discourse that lay before him, and filling him with ideas that must have been as marvellous to himself as to his audience. His subject, it appeared, had been the relation between the deity and the communities of mankind, with a special reference to the New England which they were here planting in the wilderness. And, as he drew towards the close, a spirit as of prophecy had come upon him, constraining him to its purpose as mightily as the old prophets of Israel were constrained, only with this difference, that, whereas the Jewish seers had denounced judgments and ruin on their country, it was his mission to foretell a high and glorious destiny for the newly gathered people of the Lord. But, throughout it all, and through the whole discourse, there had been a certain deep, sad undertone of pathos, which could not be interpreted otherwise than as the natural regret of one soon to pass away. Yes, their minister whom they so loved, and who so loved them all that he could not depart heavenward without a sigh, had the foreboding of untimely death upon him, and would soon leave them in their tears. This idea of his transitory stay on earth gave the last emphasis to the effect which the preacher had produced. It was as if an angel, in his passage to the skies, had shaken his bright wings over the people for an instant, at once a shadow and a splendour, and had shed down a shower of golden truths upon them. Thus there had come to the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale, as to most men in their various spheres, though seldom recognised until they see it far behind them, an epoch of life more brilliant and full of triumph than any previous one, or than any which could hereafter be. He stood, at this moment, on the very proudest eminence of superiority, to which the gifts of intellect, rich law, prevailing eloquence, and a reputation of whitest sanctity, could exalt a clergyman in New England's earliest days, when the professional character was of itself a lofty pedestal. Such was the position which the minister occupied, as he bowed his head forward on the cushions of the pulpit, at the close of his election sermon. Meanwhile Hester Prynne was standing beside the scaffold of the pillory, with the scarlet letter still burning on her breast. Now was heard again the clangour of the music, and the measured tramp of the military escort, issuing from the church door. The procession was to be marshalled thence to the town hall, where a solemn banquet would complete the ceremonies of the day. Once more, therefore, the train of venerable and majestic fathers was seen moving through a broad pathway of the people, who drew back reverently on either side, as the governor and magistrates, the old and wise men, the holy ministers, and all that were eminent and renowned, advanced into the midst of them. When they were fairly in the market-place, their presence was greeted by a shout. This, though doubtless it might acquire additional force and volume, from the childlike loyalty which the age awarded to its rulers, 
was felt to be an irrepressible outburst of enthusiasm kindled in the auditors by that high strain of eloquence which was yet reverberating in their ears. Each felt the impulse in himself, and, in the same breath, caught it from his neighbour. Within the church it had hardly been kept down. Beneath the sky it peeled upward to the zenith. There were human beings enough, and enough of highly wrought and symphonious feeling, to produce that more impressive sound than the organ-tones of the blast, or the thunder, or the roar of the sea, even that mighty swell of many voices, blended into one great voice by the universal impulse, which makes likewise one vast heart out of the many. Never from the soil of New England had gone up such a shout. Never on New England soil had stood the man so honoured by his mortal brethren as the preacher. How fared it with him, then? Whether not the brilliant particles of a halo in the air about his head? So etherealised by spirit as he was, and so apotheosized by worshipping admirers, did his footsteps, in the procession, really tread upon the dust of earth? As the ranks of military men and civil fathers moved onward, all eyes were turned towards the point where the minister was seen to approach among them. The shout died into a murmur, as one portion of the crowd after another obtained a glimpse of him. How feeble and pale he looked, amid all his triumph! The energy, or say rather, the inspiration which had held him up, until he should have delivered the sacred message that brought its own strength along with it from heaven, was withdrawn, now that it had so faithfully performed its office. The glow, which they had just before beheld burning on his cheek, was extinguished, like a flame that sinks down hopelessly among the late decaying embers. It seemed hardly the face of a man alive, with such a death-like hue. It was hardly a man with life in him, that tottered on his path so nervelessly, yet tottered and did not fall. One of his clerical brethren—it was the venerable John Wilson, observing the state in which Mr. Dimsdale was left by the retiring wave of intellect and sensibility, stepped forward hastily to offer his support. The minister tremulously but decidedly repelled the old man's arm. He still walked onward, if that movement could be so described, which rather resembled the wavering effort of an infant, with its mother's arms in view, outstretched to tempt him forward. And now, almost imperceptible as were the latter steps of his progress, he had come opposite the well-remembered and weather-darkened scaffold, where, long since, with all that dreary lapse of time between, Hester Prynne had encountered the world's ignominious stare. There stood Hester, holding little Pearl by the hand, and there was the scarlet letter on her breast. The minister here made a pause, although the music still played the stately and rejoicing march to which the procession moved. It summoned him onward, onward to the festival. But here he made a pause. Bellingham, for the last few moments, had kept an anxious eye upon him. He now left his own place in the procession, and advanced to give assistance, judging from Mr. Dimsdale's aspect that he must otherwise inevitably fall. But there was something in the latter's expression that warned back the magistrate, although a man not readily obeying the vague intimations that pass from one spirit to another. The crowd, meanwhile, looked on with awe and wonder. This earthly faintness was, in their view, only another phase of the minister's celestial strength, nor would it have seemed a miracle too high to be wrought for one so holy, had he ascended before their eyes, waxing dimmer and brighter, and fading at last into the light of heaven. He turned towards the scaffold, and stretched forth his arms. "'Hester,' said he, "'come hither. Come, my little pearl.' It was a ghastly look with which he regarded them, but there was something at once tender and strangely triumphant in it. The child, with the bird-like motion which was one of her characteristics, flew to him, and clasped her arms about his knees. Hester Prynne, slowly, as if impelled by inevitable fate, and against her strongest will, likewise drew near, but paused before she reached him. 
At this instant old Roger Chillingworth thrust himself through the crowd, or perhaps, so dark, disturbed, and evil was his look, he rose up out of some nether region, to snatch back his victim from what he sought to do. Be that as it might, the old man rushed forward and caught the minister by the arm. "'Madman, hold! What is your purpose?' whispered he. "'Wave back that woman! Cast off this child! All shall be well! Do not blacken your fame and perish in dishonour! I can yet save you! Would you bring infamy on your sacred profession?' "'Ha! Tempter! Methinks thou art too late!' answered the minister, encountering his eye, fearfully but firmly. "'Thy power is not what it was. With God's help I shall escape thee now." He again extended his hand to the woman of the scarlet letter. "'Hester Prynne!' cried he, with a piercing earnestness. "'In the name of him, so terrible and so merciful, who gives me grace, at this last moment, to do what, for my own heavy sin and miserable agony, I withheld myself from doing seven years ago, come hither now, and twine thy strength about me. Thy strength, Hester, but let it be guided by the will which God hath granted me. This wretched and wronged old man is opposing it with all his might, with all his own might and the fiend's. Come, Hester, come, support me up yonder scaffold." The crowd was in a tumult. The men of rank and dignity, who stood more immediately about the clergyman, were so taken by surprise, and so perplexed as to the purport of what they saw, unable to receive the explanation which most readily presented itself, or to imagine any other, that they remained silent and inactive spectators of the judgment which Providence seemed about to work. They beheld the minister, leaning on Hester's shoulder, and supported by her arm around him, approach the scaffold and ascend its steps, while still the little hand of the sin-born child was clasped in his. Old Roger Chillingworth followed, as one intimately connected with the drama of guilt and sorrow, in which they had all been actors, and well entitled, therefore, to be present at its closing scene. "'Hadst thou sought the whole earth over,' said he, looking darkly at the clergyman, "'there was no one place so secret, no high place, nor lowly place, where thou couldst have escaped me, save on this very scaffold." "'Thanks be to him who hath led me hither,' answered the minister. Yet he trembled, and turned to Hester with an expression of doubt and anxiety in his eyes, not the less evidently betrayed that there was a feeble smile upon his lips. "'Is not this better,' murmured he, "'than what we dreamed of in the forest?' "'I know not, I know not,' she hurriedly replied. "'Better! Yea, so we may both die, and little Pearl die with us.' "'For thee and Pearl, be it as God shall order,' said the minister. "'And God is merciful. Let me now do the will which he hath made plain before my sight. For Hester, I am a dying man, so let me make haste to take my shame upon me.' Partly supported by Hester Prynne, and holding one hand of little pearls, the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale turned to the dignified and venerable rulers, to the holy ministers who were his brethren, to the people, whose great heart was thoroughly appalled, yet overflowing with tearful sympathy, as knowing that some deep life-matter, which, if full of sin, was full of anguish and repentance likewise, was now to be laid open to them. The sun but little past its meridian, shone down upon the clergyman, and gave a distinctness to his figure, as he stood out from all the earth, to put in his plea of guilty at the bar of eternal justice. "'People of New England!' cried he, with a voice that rose over them, high, solemn, and majestic, yet had always a tremor through it, and sometimes a shriek, struggling up out of a fathomless depth of remorse and woe. Ye that have loved me, ye that have deemed me holy, behold me here, the one sinner of the world. At last, at last, I stand upon the spot where, seven years since, I should have stood, here with this woman, whose arm, more than the little strength wherewith I have crept hitherward, 
sustains me, at this dreadful moment, from grovelling down upon my face. Lo! the scarlet letter which Hester wears! Ye have all shuddered at it. Wherever her walk hath been, wherever, so miserably burdened, she might have hoped to find repose, it hath cast a lurid gleam of awe and horrible repugnance round about her. But there stood one in the midst of you, at whose brand of sin and infamy ye have not shuddered." It seemed, at this point, as if the minister must leave the remainder of his secret undisclosed. But he fought back the bodily weakness, and still more the faintness of heart, that was striving for the mastery with him. He threw off all assistance, and stepped passionately forward a pace before the woman and the child. "'It was on him,' he continued, with a kind of fierceness, so determined was he to speak out the whole. God's eye beheld it. The angels were forever pointing at it. The devil knew it well, and fretted it continually with the touch of his burning finger. But he hid it cunningly from men, and walked among you with the mien of a spirit, mournful, because so pure in a sinful world, and sad, because he missed his heavenly kindred. Now, at the death-hour, he stands up before you. He bids you look again at Hester's scarlet letter. He tells you that, with all its mysterious horror, it is but the shadow of what he bears on his own breast, and that even this, his own red stigma, is no more than the type of what has seared his inmost heart. Stand any here that question God's judgment on a sinner? Behold! Behold a dreadful witness of it! With a convulsive motion he tore away the ministerial band from before his breast. It was revealed. But it were irreverent to describe that revelation. For an instant the gaze of the horror-stricken multitude was concentrated on the ghastly miracle, while the minister stood, with a flush of triumph in his face, as one who in the crisis of acutest pain had won a victory. Then down he sank upon the scaffold. Hester partly raised him, and supported his head against her bosom. Old Roger Chillingworth knelt down beside him, with a blank, dull countenance out of which the life seemed to have departed. "'Thou hast escaped me,' he repeated more than once. "'Thou hast escaped me.' "'May God forgive thee,' said the minister. "'Thou too hast deeply sinned. He withdrew his dying eyes from the old man, and fixed them on the woman and the child. "'My little Pearl,' said he feebly, and there was a sweet and gentle smile over his face, as of a spirit sinking into deep repose. Nay, now that the burden was removed, it seemed almost as if he would be sportive with a child. "'Dear little Pearl, wilt thou kiss me now? Thou wouldst not yonder in the forest.' But now thou wilt." Pearl kissed his lips. A spell was broken. The great scene of grief, in which the wild infant bore a part, had developed all her sympathies, and, as her tears fell upon her father's cheek, they were the pledge that she would grow up amid human joy and sorrow, nor for ever do battle with the world, but be a woman in it. Towards her mother, too, Pearl's errand as a messenger of anguish was all fulfilled. "'Hester,' said the clergyman, "'farewell.' "'Shall we not meet again?' whispered she, bending her face down close to his. "'Shall we not spend our immortal life together? Surely, surely we have ransomed one another with all this woe. Thou lookest far into eternity, with those bright dying eyes, then tell me what thou seest." "'Hush, Hester, hush,' said he, with tremulous solemnity. "'The law we broke, the sin here so awfully revealed, let these alone be in thy thoughts. I fear, I fear. It may be that, when we forgot our God, when we violated our reverence each for the other's soul, it was thenceforth vain to hope that we could meet hereafter in an everlasting and pure reunion. God knows, and He is merciful. He hath proved His mercy most of all in my afflictions. 
by giving me this burning torture to bear upon my breast, by sending yonder dark and terrible man to keep the torture always at red heat, by bringing me hither to die this death of triumphant ignominy before the people. Had either of these agonies been wanting, I had been lost for ever. Praised is his name. His will be done. Farewell." That final word came forth with the minister's expiring breath. The multitude, silent till then, broke out in a strange, deep voice of awe and wonder, which could not as yet find utterance, save in this murmur that rolled so heavily after the departed spirit. End of section 26、section 27 of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter 24 Conclusion After many days, when time sufficed for the people to arrange their thoughts in reference to the foregoing scene, there was more than one account of what had been witnessed on the scaffold. Most of the spectators testified to having seen, on the breast of the unhappy minister, a scarlet letter, the very semblance of that worn by Hester Prynne, imprinted in the flesh. As regarded its origin, there were various explanations, all of which must necessarily have been conjectural. Some affirmed that the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale, on the very day when Hester Prynne first wore her ignominious badge, had begun a course of penance, which he afterwards, in so many futile methods, followed out, by inflicting a hideous torture on himself. Others contended that the stigma had not been produced until a long time subsequent, when old Roger Chillingworth, being a potent necromancer, had caused it to appear through the agency of magic and poisonous drugs. Others again, and those best able to appreciate the minister's peculiar sensibility, and the wonderful operation of his spirit upon the body, whispered their belief that the awful symbol was the effect of the ever-active tooth of remorse, gnawing from the inmost heart outward, and at last manifesting heaven's dreadful judgment by the visible presence of the letter. The reader may choose among these theories. We have thrown all the light we could acquire upon the portent, and would gladly, now that it has done its office, erase its deep print out of our own brain, where long meditation has fixed it in very undesirable distinctness. It is singular, nevertheless, that certain persons, who were spectators of the whole scene, and professed never once to have removed their eyes from the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale, denied that there was any mark whatever on his breast, more than on a newborn infant's. Neither, by their report, had his dying words acknowledged, nor even remotely implied, any, the slightest connection, on his part, with the guilt for which Hester Prynne had so long worn the scarlet letter. According to these highly respectable witnesses, the minister, conscious that he was dying, conscious also that the reverence of the multitude placed him already among saints and angels, had desired, by yielding up his breath in the arms of that fallen woman, to express to the world how entirely nugatory is the choicest of man's own righteousness. After exhausting life in his efforts for mankind's spiritual good, he had made the manner of his death a parable, in order to impress on his admirers the mighty and mournful lesson, that, in the view of infinite purity, we are sinners all alike. It was to teach them, that the holiest among us has but attained so far above his fellows as to discern more clearly the mercy which looks down, and repudiate more utterly the phantom of human merit, which would look aspiringly upward. Without disputing a truth so momentous, we must be allowed to consider this version of Mr. Dimsdale's story as only an instance of that stubborn fidelity with which a man's friends, and especially a clergyman's, will sometimes uphold his character, when proofs, clear as the midday sunshine on the scarlet letter, establish him a false and sin-stained creature of the dust. The authority which we have chiefly followed, a manuscript of old date, drawn up from the verbal testimony of individuals, some of whom had known Hester Prynne, while others had heard the tale from contemporary witnesses, fully confirms the view taken in the foregoing pages. Among many morals which press upon us from the poor minister's miserable experience, 
we put only this into a sentence. Be true, be true, be true, show freely to the world, if not your worst, yet some trait whereby the worst may be inferred. Nothing was more remarkable than the change which took place, almost immediately after Mr. Dimsdale's death, in the appearance and demeanour of the old man known as Roger Chillingworth. All his strength and energy, all his vital and intellectual force, seemed at once to desert him, insomuch that he positively withered up, shrivelled away, and almost vanished from mortal sight, like an uprooted weed that lies wilting in the sun. This unhappy man had made the very principle of his life to consist in the pursuit and systematic exercise of revenge, and when, by its completest triumph and consummation, that evil principle was left with no further material to support it, when, in short, there was no more devil's work on earth for him to do, it only remained for the unhumanized mortal to betake himself whither his master would find him tasks enough, and pay him his wages duly. But to all these shadowy beings, so long our near acquaintances, as well Roger Chillingworth as his companions, we would fain be merciful. It is a curious subject of observation and inquiry, whether hatred and love be not the same thing at bottom. Each, in its utmost development, supposes a high degree of intimacy and heart-knowledge. Each renders one individual dependent for the food of his affections and spiritual life upon another. Each leaves the passionate lover, or the no less passionate hater, forlorn and desolate by the withdrawal of his subject. Philosophically considered, therefore, the two passions seem essentially the same, except that one happens to be seen in a celestial radiance, and the other in a dusky and lurid glow. In the spiritual world, the old physician and the minister, mutual victims as they have been, may, unawares, have found their earthly stock of hatred and antipathy transmuted into golden love. Leaving this discussion apart, we have a matter of business to communicate to the reader. At old Roger Chillingworth's decease, which took place within the year, and by his last will and testament, of which Governor Bellingham and the Reverend Mr. Wilson were executors, he bequeathed a very considerable amount of property, both here and in England, to little Pearl, the daughter of Hester Prynne. So Pearl, the elf-child, the demon offspring, as some people, up to that epoch, persisted in considering her, became the richest heiress of her day in the new world. Not improbably, this circumstance wrought a very material change in the public estimation, and, had the mother and child remained here, little Pearl, at a marriageable period of life, might have mingled her wild blood with the lineage of the devoutest Puritan among them all. But, in no long time after the physician's death, the wearer of the scarlet letter disappeared, and Pearl along with her. For many years, though a vague report would now and then find its way across the sea, like a shapeless piece of driftwood tossed ashore, with the initials of a name upon it, yet no tidings of them unquestionably authentic were received. The story of the scarlet letter grew into a legend. Its spell, however, was still potent, and kept the scaffold awful where the poor minister had died, and likewise the cottage by the seashore where Hester Prynne had dwelt. Near this latter spot, one afternoon, some children were at play, when they beheld a tall woman, in a grey robe, approach the cottage door. In all those years it had never once been opened, but either she unlocked it, or the decaying wood and iron yielded to her hand, or she glided shadow-like through these impediments, and, at all events, went in. On the threshold she paused, turned partly round, for, perchance, the idea of entering alone and all so changed, the home of so intense a former life, was more dreary and desolate than even she could bear. But her hesitation was only for an instant, though long enough to display a scarlet letter on her breast and Hester Prynne had returned, and taken up her long-forsaken shame. But where was little Pearl? If still alive she must now have been in the flush and bloom of early womanhood. None knew, 
nor ever learned with the fullness of perfect certainty, whether the elf-child had gone thus untimely to a maiden grave, or whether her wild, rich nature had been softened and subdued, and made capable of a woman's gentle happiness. But, through the remainder of Hester's life, there were indications that the recluse of the scarlet letter was the object of love and interest, with some inhabitant of another land. Letters came, with armorial seals upon them, though of bearings unknown to English heraldry. In the cottage there were articles of comfort and luxury, such as Hester never cared to use, but which only wealth could have purchased, and affection have imagined for her. There were trifles, too, little ornaments, beautiful tokens of a continual remembrance, that must have been wrought by delicate fingers at the impulse of a fond heart. And once Hester was seen embroidering a baby garment, with such a lavish richness of golden fancy as would have raised a public tumult had any infant, thus apparelled, been shown to our sombre-hued community. In fine, the gossips of that day believed, and Mr. Surveyor Pugh, who made investigations a century later, believed, and one of his recent successors in office, moreover, faithfully believes, that Pearl was not only alive, but married, and happy, and mindful of her mother, and that she would most joyfully have entertained that sad and lonely mother at her fireside. But there was a more real life for Hester Prynne here, in New England, than in that unknown region where Pearl had found a home. Here had been her sin, here her sorrow, and here was yet to be her penitence. She had returned, therefore, and resumed, of her own free will, for not the sternest magistrate of that iron period would have imposed it, resumed the symbol of which we have related so dark a tale. Never afterwards did it quit her bosom. But, in the lapse of the toilsome, thoughtful, and self-devoted years that made up Hester's life, the scarlet letter ceased to be a stigma which attracted the world's scorn and bitterness, and became a type of something to be sorrowed over, and looked upon with awe, yet with reverence too. And, as Hester Prynne had no selfish ends, nor lived in any measure for her own profit and enjoyment, people brought all their sorrows and perplexities, and besought her counsel, as one who had herself gone through a mighty trouble. Women, more especially, in the continually recurring trials of wounded, wasted, wronged, misplaced, or erring and sinful passion, or with the dreary burden of a heart unyielded, because unvalued and unsought, came to Hester's cottage, demanding why they were so wretched and what the remedy. Hester comforted and counselled them as best she might. She assured them too of her firm belief that, at some brighter period, when the world should have grown ripe for it, in heaven's own time, a new truth would be revealed, in order to establish the whole relation between man and woman on a surer ground of mutual happiness. Earlier in life, Hester had vainly imagined that she herself might be the destined prophetess, but had long since recognised the impossibility that any mission of divine and mysterious truth should be confided to a woman stained with sin, bowed down with shame, or even burdened with a lifelong sorrow. The angel and apostle of the coming revelation must be a woman indeed, but lofty, pure and beautiful, and wise, moreover, not through dusky grief, but the ethereal medium of joy, and showing how sacred love should make us happy, by the truest test of a life successful to such an end. So said Hester Prynne, and glanced her sad eyes downward at the scarlet letter. And after many, many years, a new grave was delved, near an old and sunken one, in that burial-ground, beside which King's Chapel has since been built. It was near that old and sunken grave, yet with a space between, as if the dust of the two sleepers had no right to mingle. Yet one tombstone served for both. All around there were monuments carved with armorial bearings, and on this simple slab of slate, as the curious investigator may still discern, and perplex himself with the purport, there appeared the semblance of an engraved escutcheon. It bore a device, a herald's wording of what might serve for a motto, 
and brief description of our now concluded legend, so sombre is it, and relieved only by one ever-glowing point of light gloomier than the shadow. On a field, sable, the letter A, Gules. End of chapter 24 End of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne Read by Corrie Samuel